Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Key 2020 Trends to Improve Patient Collections Pre and Post Service, sponsored by Ivita Financial. I'm Morgan Hafner from Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you use to log into today's webinar to access that recording. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. First, we'll hear from Trish Rivard, CEO and founder of Eliciting Insights. Trish is an accomplished leader in healthcare revenue cycle management and technology product development with a record of growing both top line revenue and EBITDA. She founded Eliciting Insights, a market research and consulting company to provide healthcare companies with strategic insights that expedite growth. Trish's panel of US health system leaders provides insight on how the healthcare industry is responding to emerging challenges and opportunities. We'll also hear from Chris Cox, the Vice President of Product and Strategy at Ivita Financial. Chris leads enterprise growth initiatives, including product management, strategic business development, joint ventures, and mergers and acquisitions. Prior to joining Ivita Financial, Chris worked as an analyst in the financial services sector, focusing on acquisitions of residential real estate and distressed consumer asset portfolios. And joining Chris will be Greg Falconer, who is the President and General Manager at Ivita Financial. Greg oversees all financial and operational aspects of Ivita Financial and has extensive experience positioning a wide range of market disrupting products for success. With expertise in healthcare, information services, and technology, Greg brings the Ivita Financial a strong sense of strategic vision, customer and market awareness, and an ability to drive economic value. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Trish to begin today's presentation. Thank you so much, Morgan. So for today, our agenda will follow closely to the goals of this webinar. During this webinar, you will first learn the results of a recent market research study with healthcare revenue cycle leaders on trends in patient collection improvement and how they are investing in various strategies in 2020 and beyond. Next, I'll turn it over to Chris and Greg, and we will compare and contrast several patient financing approaches commonly used today. In this section, we'll take a deeper dive into payment plans, recourse lending, and non-recourse lending. And finally, we'll wrap it up with Q&A. So getting started, so we will, um, now we'll dig right into the revenue cycle research study that was conducted. The study was conducted by Eliciting Insights in August and September of 2020. Um, and what the study looked at was patient collections and um, what healthcare executives are doing right now and um, what they're planning on doing in the future, um, what's working and um, you know, what they, uh, the, the future plans are for healthcare um, revenue cycle. Eliciting Insights is a independent market research firm that works to capture industry trends and insights on behalf of technology vendors, employers, and payers. We've worked with um, a panel of healthcare executives, so we have thousands of healthcare executives that we work with who actively take our surveys and interviews and provide us with unbiased feedback on what they're currently doing as well as trends they see in the market. On a side note, I'm really excited to be presenting this and um, in our audience, we actually have many of the um, interviewees and respondents to the surveys. Um, so this is a, a really unique opportunity where we get to present the results of the study to, um, to respondents and they can see how they compare it to their peers. So for this study, um, we used a combination of interviews and surveys. So for our interviews, we interviewed five hospital CFOs as well as five VPs of revenue cycle. And for our survey, we had 100 hospital respondents, primarily acute care hospitals with up 30 critical access. 
and our respondents were primarily CFOs, VPs, and directors with functional responsibility for revenue cycle and billing office. We did have about 6% of our respondents from the patient access function. So the first question that we asked was, um, are patient collections a top priority for the revenue cycle team in 2020? And as you can see, 88% of the respondents said, yes, patient collections are a top priority. And so um, when we looked at the comments and the feedback, uh, what we saw, not surprisingly, is, you know, one of the key trends in the past, let's say, 15 to 20 years is we've seen the, the burden of responsibility really shift a lot to the patient through high deductible plans, as well as increased co-pays and co-insurance. And that makes it more important um, than ever for hospitals to continue to collect from patients. Uh, one of our respondents indicated that 22% of total dollars collected is coming from the patients. And if you take a step back and think about that, that means that hospitals really need to be collecting from the patients to keep the doors open. This is no longer a world where, you know, 5% or 3% of the cash is coming from patients. This is critical for hospitals. And then specifically to 2020, we've seen hospitals impacted with significant volume reduction as a result of COVID-19. And so hospitals have, um, have told us through interviews and through the survey feedback that um, it's more important than ever to be collecting from the patient because they have a reduced revenue stream um, in 2020. So let's talk a little bit more um, about COVID. This was an area that we, um, we dug into as well in our survey. Um, so, you know, what was the biggest impact? So on the left-hand side, what was the top um, impact to revenue in 2020 as a result of COVID? And a majority of the respondents so 83 of the respondents stated it was um, the limitation of elect elective surgeries on revenue was the biggest negative impact. Um, at the same time, on the right-hand side, you can see 84% of hospitals have seen a reduction in patient cash collections as a result of COVID. So, you know, while hospitals are seeing, um, you know, a reduction in their um, elective surgeries and their revenue, um, you know, at the same time, they're struggling to collect from patients when now more than ever they need to collect from patients. At the beginning of COVID, most hospitals altered their patient collection strategies. And so as patient, um, as uh, hospitals altered their patient collection strategies, um, you know, we, we saw, um, hospitals, a lot of hospitals, allowed patients to take one or more month off from payment plan. We saw a delay in bad debt placements um, and an increase in financial assistance as the top three areas that hospitals um, attempted to really help patients in this um, pandemic. Um, we also saw some hospitals offering larger discounts. Some uh, few hospitals implemented a new vendor of technology to help with patient collections. And a couple of hospitals actually stopped sending out patient statements completely. Given that patient cash is critical to keeping the doors open and preventing layoffs, hospitals need a more sustainable approach. And we anticipate that um, we're actually going to see hospitals implementing new vendors or new technology to really help with patient collections going forward um, as, a, as a way to help with this, um, you know, financial impact of this um, pandemic. So now let's talk about what healthcare our SAM leaders are doing that's moving the needle on patient collections and what they're planning on doing in the future. So in this slide, um, we can see programs that hospitals are currently implementing to collect from patients. I realize that the font may be a little bit small. Um, so the programs primarily that hospitals are collecting, so on the top is pre and point of service programs, and on the bottom is the post-service collection practices. 
So pre and point of service, hospitals are um, offering hospital payment plans. They're doing pre-service collections. They're doing um, pre-service estimates and prompt pay discounts are the top four strategies. Post-service hospitals are offering hospital payment plans. They're using online payment portals, bad debt agency, and early out agencies are the top collection strategies. What we can see is hospitals are using many different strategies to collect from patients. And that, um, interestingly enough, hospital payment plans are the most utilized program, both pre and point of service and post service, which I found to be really interesting that you know such a large percentage of hospitals are doing um, payment plans pre service. So then we asked we asked our respondents of the programs they're using, which programs are working, which programs are most effective. And our respondents stated in pre and point of service, again on the top, is staff incentives for collections, hospital payment plans, prompt pay discounts, pre-service estimates, and pre-service collections were the most effective strategies. Post-service, our respondents said propensity to pay scoring, hospital payment plans, early out agency, staff incentive for collection, and online payment patient portals. What's so interesting is while propensity to pay scoring and staff incentives were not widely used, the hospitals that actually used those programs found them to be highly effective. One of our interviewees really summarized it best. So a vice president of revenue cycle for a large health system in the Midwest said, it's not one thing. Improving patient collections is a lot of little things. Patient collections needs to be hardwired into the job description for staff. We also asked respondents what their top challenges are when collecting from patients. So, um, we had um, several respondents talking about the, the burden. So for example, high deductible and high balances are overwhelming for many patients. Um, other health systems talked about the challenges of just creating an estimate. So having solid upfront estimates to determine patient responsibility. Uh, others talked about getting employees to ask for money where registration clerks and financial counselors have traditionally been focused on collecting accurate data. Now we're asking them to also talk with patients about collection and collection programs. It's a different skill set and does take you know, time to develop those skills, um, you know, or you know, sometimes it's just you know, not a skill set that, um, that the team has. Um, so many patients um, have no jobs, and especially, you know, in reference to COVID-19, this was a, a stronger theme, not surprisingly, in 2020. Um, scheduling within three days from date of service reduces time to collect. So, you know, we all know late add-ons to the schedule create a challenge when you have to get a prior off or check for authorization. Then you have to figure out what the patient responsibility is and reach back out to the patient and let them know about their responsibility and do a collection attempt before our service with very little time can always be a challenge. Um, others talked about just offering easy ways for the patient to pay. And then another theme is patients um, don't always understand their insurance. So patients understanding balance after insurance um, or denial of service a lot of times, um, hospitals are really the ones that have to explain to patients how their insurance works and what they're covered for. And this puts both the, the hospital and the, the patient in a tough position when, um, you know, when their insurance program doesn't cover um, a lot of the, the services they need. Patient satisfaction. So patient satisfaction when collecting from patients, 95% of hospitals stated patient satisfaction is, is either very important or important when collecting from patients. And so again, this is a challenge when hospitals are stuck educating patients on their benefits and their lack of coverage and really get stuck in the middle um, you know, with the patient. And you know, obviously, you know, bills are typically more than the patient anticipated they would be. Aggressive collection practices. 
So this was a very interesting theme that came up in the interviews, and we were able to um, include this in the survey. So hospitals often talk about the importance of patient satisfaction, and when they work with vendors, they don't want vendors to use aggressive collection practices. But what we found was, um, not surprisingly, 97% of hospitals do send accounts to bad debt. But we do have a surprisingly um, good amount of hospitals that notify credit agencies, use wage garnishments, and put liens on property or sell the receivable. And when we drilled into this in the interviews, what we learned was hospitals genuinely want to work with the patient. And when the patient calls, the hospitals will bend over backwards to do whatever they can for the patient, setting the patient up on a loan program that they can afford, a payment plan they can afford, setting the, you know, working with the patient to try to get them some financial assistance or get them on Medicaid, um, and even offering the patient significant discounts if it's a large balance and they're underinsured. Um, but it's really the patients that are non-responsive to the hospital, that are not calling the hospital, not working with the hospital, and have income or assets. And that's when the hospital may use some of these more aggressive collection practices. So now looking at what programs hospitals are planning to implement. So um, we asked the health, um, health system executives to select all of the programs that they're planning to implement in the next 12 to 18 months. And the top response was pre and day of service estimates. And at first I was a little surprised, but when we put this in the context of CMS price transparency, and the new requirements that are going to affect January of 2021, you can see that hospitals that haven't gotten a good price estimate, price transparency program in place are currently um, working very hard to get that in place. Um, the next um, top initiative that we saw as a result of this study was digital self-service experience for patients. And this is a trend that we've seen as eliciting insights um, over the past year or so. We've seen a really strong trend where patient access teams are implementing self-service solutions for patients. And prior to COVID, it was really with a focus on um, patient satisfaction. Um, now what we're seeing is we're seeing that trend continue even more. And um, as a result of COVID, not only is it patient satisfaction, but it's also patient safety and staff safety to have the patient do as much of the registration, self-service, pre-visit, online, you know, in their cars, not, not as part of, um, you know, as they're sitting in a waiting room or, you know, working with the registration clerk. Other programs that we're seeing gain a lot of momentum are loan programs, propensity to pay, omni-channel communication, and staff incentives. Um, interestingly, 20% of hospitals do not plan to implement any of the programs on this list. And then um, just want to call out, we did have one write-in. Um, one um, respondent indicated that they're planning on implementing consolidated patient statements. And, um, Consolidated patient statements came up in the interviews as um, a really important solution. So now with EPIC, you can create a consolidated patient statement and the hospitals that have implemented, and it, it can be a significant amount of work, um, you know, sometimes just, you know, coordinating between the hospital and the physician groups and, you know, aligning on discounts and how everything will flow can be a lot of work but hospitals that have implemented consolidated patient statements have said it's been well worth it and it has very much increased patient satisfaction and it's reduced incoming calls from patients about, well, with questions about their bills. So loan programs. So loan programs are another area that we dug into. So, um, 21% of respondents are either implementing or considering implementing loan programs, and another 25% of respondents currently offer loan programs. 
So we wanted to take a look at loan programs and really understand, are they effective? So we know that patient satisfaction is important and obviously collecting cash is, is important. So when we look at patient loan programs, um, what we found was overwhelmingly yes, 94% of respondents who have loan programs say they're effective and 94% say they're effective with patient satisfaction. Um, we had several um, several good quotes from our interviews. So a CFO of a mid-sized Midwest hospital said, with our loan vendor, we get the cash up front and the dollars off the AR. Implementing a patient loan program definitely increases patient collections. And then we had another quote from a VP of Revenue Cycle from the Midwest. We heard from other health systems that implementing a patient loan program is a small windfall and they are currently in the process of implementing their loan. While loans were described as an effective strategy, uh, we did get some feedback that um, on recourse loans versus non-recourse loans. So recourse loans where um, when the patient defaults, the money is um, taken back from the health system. Um, we got some feedback from health systems that that could be a nightmare to administer um, the back and forth. So where um, the patient starts to make payments and there's a, there's a default and then a take back, it could, be, um, it could be nightmarish and something that um, for that reason, some health systems have actually um, shied away from loan programs. Okay. So in conclusion, so from our, our study, so uh, what we found in the patient collections study is that patient collections is, in fact, a key area of focus, and it continues to be with COVID. And really, successful hospitals implement many collection programs. We're seeing several programs gain traction, so propensity to pay, staff incentives, loan financing, digital self-service, and omni-channel communication. And specifically, loan programs can be an important tool in your patient collection program. The dollars are off the AR, and it could be a small windfall. It increases patient satisfaction. Um, and, and we have a, um, a, a quote from a CFO of Mid Midwest Regional Hospital who said, loans open up a payment solution to patients who previously had no solution. So, you know, in summary, it's you know, it's, it's like the quote we saw earlier, it's not one thing, it's really a combination. It's really a comprehensive approach of many different solutions that make a patient collection strategy effective. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris, who will talk more about patient financing approaches. Wonderful, thanks Trish. Hi everyone. I hope you all enjoyed Trish's research findings. So far, we spent the afternoon discussing COVID, how providers look at patient self-pay balances, and the tools available to resolve these balances. But let, let's take a few minutes and talk through how patients think about paying for healthcare. So despite popular sentiment, patients as a whole actually want to pay their healthcare bills. It's just a matter of how we engage them and ask for payment. I'm sure we've all seen the latest statistic from the Federal Reserve showing 40% of Americans are unable to cover a $400 emergency. This is especially important in healthcare, given consumers rarely anticipate or budget for healthcare procedures. And the out-of-pocket costs to consumers are only going to increase as high deductible plans become more and more prevalent. I think we can all agree that the average self-paid balance billed to patients can be much greater than $400, and it, and it probably isn't going to decrease anytime soon. So really, what we have is a deficiency in addressing a patient's ability to pay for health care. It's not their willingness. This willingness to pay for health care is powerful, and the onus is on us to provide patients with simple easy to use tools to help manage their obligations. One of those tools is patient financing. And really, financing allows the borrower to pay over time while securing cash for the provider immediately. 
it's actually a bit of a win-win scenario. So let's, let's dive a little deeper into the benefits of patient financing. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a list of program benefits, which, which are great. But before we can fully appreciate the ROI associated with patient financing, I think it's important to level set and discuss the reality around collection rates of self-pay balances. Despite all the tools currently deployed in healthcare systems today, and this includes propensity to the pay scoring, it includes uh, web portals on the back end, it includes early out and bad debt uh, arrangements with third parties, the, the average collection rate on a patient's self-pay balance is around 12%. And what this effectively means is that out of 100% that's billed to the patient, 88% of that balance goes on to be uncollected. And sure, there are certain demographics and groups of people who pay at a higher propensity than others. Uh, a quick example is just looking at, some, at whether someone has insurance. According to a study conducted by Crow Horwath, a patient who has either commercial insurance or Medicare pays over twice as much as someone without insurance. So every health system's payer mix is going to lead to differing collection rates, but at the end of the day, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And this is where patient financing comes in. By introducing a patient financing tool, what you're effectively doing is transferring the risk of repayment over to the lender and receiving funds immediately at a much higher rate than what you would have collected on your own while also providing the patient with an affordable way to pay their balance over time. This will ultimately allow providers to reduce their cost to collect and increase patient satisfaction. It can also reduce canceled procedures if it's emphasized at pre-service, giving patients the peace of mind that there is an easy way to pay for their healthcare. Regarding the ability to do reduce risk depends on the type of financing that you choose. Now, not all patient financing programs are created equal. There, there, are different, there are differences you need to be aware of and how they might apply to your health system. Specifically, the differences between payment plans, which isn't really financing, but it does achieve some of the same benefits, uh, recourse and non-recourse lending. So as Trish alluded to earlier, Payment plans are pretty much ubiquitous across healthcare. There's very little barrier to entry to offering a payment plan. And there's this belief or this hope that each patient is going to pay off their plan in full, where in reality, managing a payment plan is, is a hassle. And rarely do you ever collect the balance in full in a timely manner. Uh, the, the, and there's an entire industry built around managing portfolios of accounts receivables and mitigating default rate risk. It's, it's called banking. And from the providers that I've had the pleasure of interacting with, most of them want to get out of that business. And back to focusing on what hospitals do best, which is providing quality care to their patients. Another tool available to providers is recourse lending, which is a little bit less traditional. Unlike payment plans where a provider collects a little bit of cash each month, a recourse lender will provide the funds for the balance up front and allow for the patient to pay over time. The key thing to remember about recourse loan programs is that it doesn't actually de-risk the provider's balance sheet. If the patient doesn't pay the loan, the balance is given back to the hospital. This can, this can create an unwieldy reconciliation process for your business office, and it also doesn't leave the patient with the best consumer experience. This is especially important during times like now with COVID-19 causing increased unemployment rates, leaving consumers with little ability to pay back their loans, and honestly, leaving hospitals holding the bag on the unpaid balances. Where, and you've got non-recourse lending, which is a bit more traditional in that once the provider is funded for the loan balance, the lender is then fully responsible for managing the relationship with the patient. So if the patient defaults on the loan, the balance is never returned to the hospital. This method provides the hospital with immediate cash acceleration and the patient with the means to pay over time. 
The difference is the hospital no longer has to worry about the risk of repayment. Now, there are three things to explore or question when talking with a non-recourse lender. So number one, what is the fee for their services? Um, are there any hidden fees to me, the provider? Are, is, are there any fees to my patient? Uh, is there a retroactive APR that's introduced? Are, are there origination fees? How much of an increase in collections can I expect to see by implementing the non-recourse program? So it's important to understand how the lender prices for their services. Uh, number two, how do you decide who qualifies for a loan? And honestly, this is really important for both recourse and non-recourse lenders. Um, I, I would advise that finding a lender who provides credit to all patients uh, in, in your healthcare system is really important. Um, and lastly, number three, how, how do you treat my patient if they fail to repay the loan? Um, you want to be confident the lender is going to treat your borrowers in the same manner that you treat your patients. You want to make sure that there is a fit um, in, in the approach in working with your patient population. So in summary, payment plans are easy to implement, but difficult to manage at scale. And you also lose out on the benefits of cash acceleration that you receive with uh, patient financing. So for recourse loans, they help accelerate cash and they, and they do improve collections, but the risk of repayment still falls on the hospital. And I, I, just a note of caution, um, with stated recourse rates, there are a few tactics that can be used to lower this percentage while still being able to tout that it is truly available to everyone. So just keep an eye on that. Um, and then lastly, uh, with non-recourse loans, you get immediate cash acceleration and improved collections while eliminating the risk of repayment to the hospital and avoiding any type of reconcilia reconciliation efforts on the back end. Just make sure you understand how the program is priced. So if anyone has any questions about these financing models or wants to learn more about how best to utilize these types of programs, I highly encourage you to reach out to me personally or wait to the end of the call and submit your question to the moderator. I'm incredibly passionate about this topic and would love to help in any way I can. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Greg to wrap things up. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh... First of all, I just want to say thank you guys for sharing your time with us this afternoon. We're super excited to be working with Listing Insights and Beckers on this survey. And I hope you all found it insightful, relevant, and helpful. One of the things this survey has brought to light to me was there just doesn't appear to be any single prevailing program or approach that drives higher collection yields in itself. And the use of multiple programs working in conjunction with one another tends to yield a better overall performance. And that not all patients necessarily respond to all collection strategies the same way. For us, we feel that the credit challenged patients deserve an opportunity to responsibly pay for their healthcare bills. They just often lack an affordable option to do so. And affordability is key. But so are a few other things. We gotta make the program 0%. You You gotta provide long-term payback options. And you've gotta make the experience simple and straightforward. You know, it's, it's just gotta work on a cell phone. And you gotta make sure all your patients can have it. Not just those with gold cards and perfect credit. For us, we knew providers needed a program for everyone, for all patients. So we kind of stepped back and rethought about how lending should work for patients. And what we realized is the traditional credit score based approach to approve people left out a lot of people. So we built our model based on affordability, finding the right payment for each individual. We then added a lot of flexibility uh, in how you repay that, uh, that obligation, understanding that Situations change, jobs are lost, natural disasters happen, 
yet we fundamentally believe that most people want to be responsible. In fact, we believe in this approach so much that we're willing to put our balance sheet at risk and make this program non-recourse. And we're doing it for all patients, regardless of credit score. So taking on that full responsibility of repayment really means that we're fundamentally inspired to work with each patient, lending and leading with empathy to enable them to successfully pay for their health care bills. But don't just take it from me. Here's what our patients are saying about having a 0% financing program to pay for health care. I can tell you patients just love this program. Aligning a user-friendly mobile tech coupled with a compassionate approach that enables borrowers to successfully pay down their lines of credit so, again, they can return to the hospital and reuse it. And I think that's really the key. Patients need to feel confident in their ability to afford health care. With that, uh, Mag Morgan, I'd like to hand things back to you to help us through some questions, if you don't mind. Of course, Greg, and thank you, Trish and Chris, as well, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session, so please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your dashboard. We're going to try to get through as many questions as we have time for, and we already have some great audience questions coming through today. So I'll start with a question. I think this one will probably go to Trish. Um, it's about how do you find um, the 100 RCM leaders that took the survey that you spoke about? Sure. Thanks. Great question. So um, at Elicity Insights, so we have a panel of several thousand healthcare executives. And so, um, you know, over time we have worked with, um, you know, with many of these respondents and solicited um, feedback from them. So the respondents will typically get a, um, you know, a, a incentive for taking our survey or for, um, for doing our interviews. And, um, you know, we keep their information um, so we do not sell um, you know or give their information to anyone and um, and so you know over time we've been able to build a relationship with um, thousands of healthcare executives and um, and so that's how we um, pulled the information together for the study that's really interesting thanks for diving deeper into that and another question for you trish came in about um, you know, the, those aggressive collection practices you talked about. They said, I was surprised to see on that slide that 42% of hospitals survey notified credit agencies for patients who don't pay their bills. They're wondering if that's representative of the industry as a whole. So what we typically find is, um, you know, there's about 5,000 hospitals in the U.S. And so with a sample size of over 80, so, you know, 80 to 100, um, we usually find that that is fairly representative of the um, survey. Uh, I think what's important here is when we ask the question, we ask the question as, you know, essentially as a yes or no, if you do it at all. So if the hospital, you know, does it, you know, once a year, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, a, you know, a large count in a patient that, you know, they've tried really hard to work with, um, you know, then, then they would select the answer yes. And so, um, I, you know, I think that is part of the story that is going on here because we did hear from the, um, from the interviews that, um, you know, aggressive collection practices were things that were, um, you know, very, um, very thought out before they were implemented. Got it. That's a really helpful insight as well. Thanks so much, Trish. And this next question um, that's coming through might be a good one for Chris or Greg. Um, you know, an audience member is really curious about what happens when a patient doesn't pay back their loans and sort of any feedback you have on that question. <clears throat> sure, I, I can take that. And it, it's a good question. It, re it really depends on the type of loan. Um, if it's recourse-based, the, the hospital remains at risk until the loan is paid. Um, if it's not paid, the balance is given back to the hospital, right? Um, and, and we've heard uh, from providers that the reconciliation process can be time-consuming and somewhat challenging. Um, if 
if a loan doesn't pay back and it's a non-recourse loan, then the lender is fully responsible for the balance, meaning it will never be returned to the hospital. Um, for us, for Ivita, that means you know we take on the risk and, and work to make the borrower successful in repaying their loan, um, so they can, you know, so they can reuse their line of credit at the hospital. I hope that answers your question. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a great answer, Chris. Thank you for diving deeper into that. Um, and just another reminder, audience, um, please submit any questions you have. We have a lot of great commentary coming through, so really appreciate it. Um, and Chris or Greg, this next question uh, may be great for either of you as well. An audience member is wondering, if I already have a payment program in place, why should I consider adding a loan program? That's a great question. Uh, well, I think the first question to ask is what are the priorities? If cash acceleration, which you know, uh, in this in this moment in our in our history, probably is as important as anything for uh, our providers, and taking away the risk of bad debt, if those are important, loan programs are great. They're a great tool for that. Uh, from a patient perspective, if they want, want long payback periods, say up to three years, and they typically want payments that they can afford, many of these low, loan programs have a degree of flexibility that works great for patients. Uh, and as kind of Chris said, if you go with the non-recourse type, uh, for every patient that chooses a loan, that's just one less account you have to worry about, one less account you have to collect on, and one less account you have to reserve for bad debt on. So uh, I think loan programs in a, with payment plans, there's a time and place for each one. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, each patient is unique in uh, how, how they can pay for uh, health care and uh, oftentimes building the flexibility into a payment plan uh, it can be somewhat challenging creating all those rules and, and all the different kind of versions and nuances that you want, uh, but partnering with loan uh, program providers that have that inherent in their technology, sometimes it's a, it's a good option and it's one that you can implement quickly. Great question. Yeah, that was a great question and really appreciate that perspective as well. Um, we got another question coming in about um, non-recourse financing limits, and it's, it's an observation, and I think anyone who wants to weigh in with their thoughts on it, it would be um, beneficial. So uh, it's, the observation is non-recourse financing limits um, the population that the lender would be willing to fund, where recourse opens it up to all patients with no limitations on credit. So their, their thought is that you can obtain more cash by opening it up to more of a population. Chris or Greg, what are your thoughts on this and any observations that um, you would have? Chris, you want to? Uh, sure, yeah, I, I can questions? take it. Yeah, so um, we actually, we completely agree. Um, I think it's it's really important as you're doing your due diligence and looking at uh, the various offerings by lenders, right, both recourse and non-recourse. Um, traditional non-recourse lenders in healthcare have typically had very tight underwriting criteria. And when, I'm, when I say underwriting, uh, I'm going back to that kind of that second question I alluded to earlier in the presentation of, of figuring out who qualifies for a loan. Um, and traditional um, with, with, with a traditional lending background, uh, banks would have tight underwriting criteria. So only your, your gold card members or your people with really high FICO scores um, get access to credit. Um, well, the unfortunate thing is that really doesn't help the people who actually need that uh, access to credit, the folks who don't qualify. So um, I completely agree finding a non-recourse lender um, who has uh, a program that addresses the vast majority of uh, your underlying patient's population is really, really important. Um, and just, uh, and, and we, our, our philosophy on underwriting is that we believe uh, that every patient 
uh, deserves access to credit regardless of their credit score. Um, so that, that, that's kind of a, a core tenet of ours. Great. Awesome, awesome absolutely. observation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for breaking that down even a little bit further. Um, we have another question about non-recourse lending um, to kind of dive into that a little bit further. And the audience member is wondering, um, is credit score used for identifying if a patient quali qualifies? Um, I'll take that. So, uh, okay. Go for it, Greg. Thanks. No, go ahead. So, uh, again, is credit score used uh, to qualify patients for loans? That is a, that's a key question you ask anybody you are interviewing or considering to implement their program. It really varies. Uh, lenders out there have a traditional approach to managing risk, and one way of doing that is looking at credit score. As Chris told you, we don't have that approach. Uh, our approach is based around affordability, a person's uh, ability uh, and willingness to pay uh, and how much they can afford uh, is how we've structured our program. Uh, but it is a kind of an individual program specific thing, uh, the underwriting or what tools they use to assess uh, if they're going to lend money or not. Got it. So it's kind of a case by case situation there. Um, another question about non-recourse loans. Um, audience member is wondering if either of you could restate the possible fees of a non-recourse loan. Sure, I, I can uh, I can talk to that. Um, so again, it really depends on who the lender is. Um, if if you've been in your local uh, dentist office, I'm sure you see pamphlets for uh, medical financing. Um, and, you know, that program is designed for really high credit, high FICO, high credit worthy uh, borrowers or applicants, and their pricing model could be different from someone who is more prevalent in a uh, more acute care facility. Um, so typically what we've seen with respect to pricing models for non-recourse loan programs is a combination of um, consumer interest and consumer fees, right, which is uh, considered very traditional, or uh, a, a uh, function of taking a discount or, or a service fee based on the balance of the loan that is originated. Um, and I kind of alluded to this earlier when I said you have to really understand the fees. Um, what you should do before you enter into any agreement with a non-recourse lender, make sure you understand what that discount uh, fee is on the balance originated and make sure that you understand how much you're collecting today to be able to calculate your ROI or the lift in collections that you would expect as a result of the non-recourse program. Excellent. A really helpful breakdown there. Thank you again for going over that. Um, this next question is specific to um, IVITA's program. Um, an audience member is wondering, is there a minimum and maximum loan amount for patients within IVITA's program? Yeah. Um, so for our program specifically, we have a uh, minimum balance of $500 and a maximum balance of $8,000. Um, and I'll just touch on briefly here why we did that. We believe that if a balance falls under that $500 mark, uh, that the chances are that the provider and the patient can work out uh, an arrangement to satisfy that obligation. Um, and then when you think about the upper end of our lending range, that's really where you start to see the cap put on high deductible healthcare plans. Um, so we wanted to create a program that captured uh, the majority of patient balances seen within a healthcare system. It was a good question. Yeah, I agree, a great question. Um, and, and a reminder, if anyone else has any more questions, um, please submit them in the Q&A box you see on your screen. This has been just a spectacular discussion. Um, 
We have another question that's specific to outpatient programs. Someone is wondering, do the hospitals do this as, as in loan payments for their outpatient programs to um, specialty pharmacy? pharmacy? So uh, our program, if you if you uh, sit down with us and, and have a deeper conversation, uh, you'll realize our philosophy is a lot about pre-service, a lot about uh, establishing uh, a patient estimate up front. But the program's designed to really help patients at all access points through all types of service uh, and treatment. So we're kind of service line agnostic, uh, but. I think the goal is to look at each individual hospital, understand where the challenges are and where the patient volumes uh, tend to kind of have those balances that work well into loan programs. But absolutely, we've, uh, we've supported, uh, especially pharmacy programs uh, with our providers, you bet. Got it, thank you. And we do have a question that came through about safety net hospitals in general, and they're just wondering what is their ability to offer payment plans? Chris, I think you could talk a little bit about uh, payment plans and and uh, really if there's an outstanding balance, the ability to kind of spread that out over multiple payments, I think it's a pretty straightforward uh, uh, concept that most hospitals have tried to uh, at least something in place, right? Yeah, I mean, what's what's great about payment plans is that it's uh, there's no barriers to entry, right? You don't have to necessarily partner with a third party in order to offer a payment plan. Um, it's just it's a financial arrangement with the underlying patient to help them um, to help them spread out their payments over time. Uh, which which is a huge 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 benefit to the to patients and actually we've seen that in talking with a handful of providers who have said look we've looked at lending but we've just done a really really good job of monetizing our payment plan program um, but when when you sit back and you kind of survey the healthcare landscape not every hospital provider that we've seen has done an, uh, an incredibly good job at monetizing it. I think the, uh, the age-old story you hear, and, and you, yeah, I think you still see, is the, the patient that has a payment plan where they're paying $25 a month and they have a $6,000 balance. You know, they're not going to pay the balance off for, for years. Um, and, and that happens a lot because uh, at the end of the day, it's the path of least resistance. Um, I, I hope that was helpful. Absolutely. I think that was really helpful and to kind of give more information around that. So thanks for submitting that question and also answering it. Um, another audience member is um, just wants to go over about that interest. Um, they say, I might, I might have missed it, but is there any interest involved with these loans that we're talking about today? Yeah, I can uh, I can address that. Um, so uh, the the short the, the answer is no. Um, we we designed our program as a line of credit, uh, so it's a reusable product that is kind of designed to keep a relationship with the with the patient to the underlying hospital system, um, and it's uh, it's zero percent interest. Period. There, we don't have any origination fees. We don't have any early payment fees. We we don't even have uh, NSF fees or late fees. Um, I, I would argue this is probably one of the most consumer friendly products in the market, at least from what I've seen. A great question, and we have um, one about applying for these loans. They are wondering. You know, are these are these loans on behalf of patients, or does the patient apply directly through IVITA for them? So I'll I'll answer Chris. Uh, awesome. You know, again, our uh, our focus is to set up a financial clearance process with each of our providers that encourages patient estimation and engaging the financial conversation early. Uh, 
people that are financially cleared tend to not reschedule their appointments or have further anxiety about uh, their treatment, and we think that's absolutely important. So uh, the answer is that we're part of a financial clearance process that the registrars and schedulers kind of engage with patients on. So it is a joint effort, uh, but our technology does allow in a post-service setting uh, if a patient were to get uh, a bill in the mail or, or, uh, or a call from uh, uh, about following up on a bill, they were able to apply for a loan post-service. But again, uh, we feel the best practice and we'd like to, uh, we work with our providers to implement these uh, financial clearance kind of best practices is to do the patient estimation and have that line of credit arranged, pre-arranged, uh, pre-service. Excellent. A great question and just an overall awesome discussion. Unfortunately, we've come up to the end of our time together today. Um, so I want to give a final thank you to the audience for their just wonderful participation and also Trish, Chris, and Greg for excellent presentation, as well as Ibuta Financial for sponsoring today's webinar. So please, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. We truly look forward to having you join us for future webinars.